So the topic of tonight is the new weird. It's the theme, but it's also a sort of anti-theme because it's a premise to talk about texts and experiences that don't fit in categories. It doesn't mean I'm not gonna try to pin things down, but that definitions are bound to fall short. That's partly because new weird is a category of writing defined mostly by negation, what it doesn't want to be. It doesn't want to be realist fiction, it doesn't want to be science fiction, it doesn't want to be fantasy fiction or any sub-genre of those genres, even though it shares elements in common with all of those. It wants to be outside of those categories because it's about the outside. The outside might be the non-human, plant, animal, mineral, alien, other, or a complex system of humans and non-humans, the internet, finance, capital, the climate, or it might be about the uncanny aspects of everyday life when your words for describing the world fall short. But of course, like any time you try to identify a set of practices or aesthetics that seem to congeal around a certain set of ideas, you give them a name and in doing so you create another inside. In the case of new weird fiction, you create a marketable category, a canon organized around certain authors, and something you can analyze and critique. This has all happened to the term new weird over the years, and for that reason, a lot of writers don't even want to be associated with it. So the name new weird inherently defeats itself, and it's also nothing new. As a literary classification, it's been around since at least the early 2000s. And if you're looking for direct literary precedents, you could find them in the new wave fiction of the 60s or the horror fiction of the 80s. The reason new weird is called new is both to connect it to and distinguish it from the old weird, a name retroactively given to certain writing from the late 19th and early 20th century. The quintessential old weird writer is H.P. Lovecraft. If you've heard of him, it's probably for his now famous 1926 story, The Call of Cthulhu, which is about a horrific, tentacled, ancient creature who rises from the depths of time and overwhelms the main character's sense of reason and agency. And the story is emblematic of the weird because it deals with the wonder and the horror at the fringes of human consciousness. Lovecraft has come back into prominence in recent years in philosophy and art and literary criticism. This is not him, I just cuttlefish. Um, <laughs> This is partly because in the words of our first speaker tonight, Alison Sperling, quote, Lovecraft's work seems to anticipate the Anthropocene with a model of deep space and time that suggests the relative inconsequence of the human species, unquote. Lovecraft was also a problematic figure. A lot of his works and ideas are clearly racist and xenophobic. So when thinking about the new weird in relation to his legacy, there's been a lot of debate about how to consider his role. But the problematic nature of the origins of the weird, if you do trace it to Lovecraft, open up some important questions. For instance, how fascination and fear of the other might be embedded in the very idea of what's weird. For instance, certain marginalized bodies have always been designated weird, historically aligned with the freaky, abnormal, or threatening. In that sense, to weird today could also be to queer or even just to de-westernize or to map on the same strangeness certain subjects have historically been afforded onto other subjects in order to reveal the inherent strangeness of all of those constructs. To zoom in on some of the formal qualities of weird fiction to prepare for the talks tonight, I'll offer its two major negations, what it isn't. Those would be the genres of science fiction and fantasy. This is the science fiction slide. Science fiction and fantasy are most, the most common terms for fiction that isn't beholden to traditional realism, realism being stories that try to mirror reality as closely as possible, but of course realism is an invention just like any other. In the words of Tom McCarthy, tonight's third speaker, quote, realism is as laden with artifice as any other literary convention. So I'd say let's throw that out. Um, science fiction, although it doesn't try to be real, Science fiction has historically been aligned with reason and rationality, the foundations of scientific progress since the Enlightenment. A traditional science fiction story from the 19th or 20th century imagines a future or alternate world with one or a few significant differences from our own. There's time travel, or aliens landed, or robots are sentient. This kind of device has been given a name by the critic Darko Suven, called the novum, the novum being the scientifically plausible innovation that signals the story world as different from our own. But in science fiction, that fictional element intervenes into the world as we know it. 
it probably accords with the known laws of physics. Rational cause and effect still apply. Jim Clark, our second speaker tonight, describes this by saying that, quote, science fiction is full of stories in which superstition is defeated by explanation, the immaterial is tamed by manifestation, unquote. In other words, you might have aliens, but you don't have magic. Fantasy, on the other hand, has magic. What happens in a fantasy story need not be bound to scientific principles. You can start in a made-up world where the rules already don't apply. You could have dragons, vampires, or elves. Gravity might not work. People have superpowers. But there's no burden of explaining how all that happened. They just did because magic. Both science fiction and fantasy come with obvious pitfalls. Whereas science fiction can end up perpetuating ideas of historical progress related to technological advancement, fantasy can end up as romantic wish fulfillment and exoticism. Both genres have often ended up reproducing pretty normative and boring social hierarchies. The white man colonizes the cosmos, or the beautiful woman tames the exotic dragon, etc. They each have flip, flip sides of what is actually the same relationship to explanation. In science fiction, the novelty is explained away whereas fantasy makes rational logic irrelevant. In one, everything about the mystery becomes known. In the other, nothing need be known. It's magic. The reason I'm interested in the weird is exactly because it hovers between those poles of explaining everything and explaining nothing. In this way, it resists the idea that everything can be explained by humans at all. However, it doesn't give up on the primacy of human experience and our ability to access and comprehend the world because it's still a story. In questioning explainability using the human tool of literature, the new weird can also make the human an unfamiliar category whose central importance in the universe is not self-evident. Toward this end, the theorist Mark Fisher defines the weird simply as that which does not belong. The weird creates an outside space, he says, that lies beyond standard perception, cognition, and experience. But to Fisher, the weird state is not just the awareness that an outside exists. It's actually the perceptual flip that happens when you suddenly see back at yourself from the outside that you now realize exists. It's only when you get a glimpse back at normality from abnormality that you realize you've been living in an inside zone at all. In Fisher's words, quote, if the weird entity or object is here, then the categories which we've up until now used to make sense of the world can't be valid. The weird thing is not wrong. It is our conceptions that must be inadequate. For instance, a typical fantasy creature like a vampire isn't actually weird, because even though it's supernatural, it's altogether familiar. You probably know what one looks like and what it's supposed to do. On the other hand, a black hole is very weird, because it exists, even though we don't know how. Fisher provides another companion term to the weird, which is the eerie. For him, the eerie is tied up in questions of agency, things happening in the world, the cause of which we can't quite trace. This uncoupling of cause and effect undermines the power of the human and opens up the possibility of other eerie actors. The sensation of the eerie occurs either when there is something present where there should be nothing, or there is nothing present where there should be something. Both the weird and the eerie are useful concepts because they undermine the notion of solvability, the belief that the mystery could just be decoded and the mechanism driving the weirdness could be revealed. In traditional science fiction and fantasy, the encounter with the non-human, alien, AI, vampire, whatever, can go a predictable number of ways, which um, Jim Clark, our second speaker, pointed out to me. The usual options are to fight, to flee, or attempt to understand. Understand meaning to examine, quantify, and describe. But what if none of those works? What if fighting is futile because the non-human doesn't respond to human violence, running away is impossible because the non-human is all-encompassing, and trying to understand is useless because the non-human is unexplainable according to current ontological structures? Then you end up having to try something really weird. In this state or zone of unexplainability, things can get really uncomfortable. And so there's a strong urge to try to explain it away in fiction and in life. Maybe the person occupying the weird zone or reporting back from it has just been dreaming. Maybe they're insane. Maybe they're on drugs. These are all ways of justifying and therefore neutralizing the threat of weirdness. But the weird doesn't actually have to be threatening or terrifying. It could be extremely beautiful and maybe even enjoyable because it's new. 
Unknowability and non-humanity are only truly horrifying concepts within an anthropocentric framework that prizes current human being in its current state over all other forms and ways of being. To avoid total horror, the human has to be decentered from the story. One might argue that given the state of the planet right now, these are exactly the types of narratives we need. The climate itself could be thought of as a weird unknowable entity. It can certainly be scientifically studied and measured, and it should be, so we understand what we've done to it, but it really can't be accessed on the level of human perceptual experience. I think the theorist Wendy Chun put it best when she said, you can't experience the climate, you can only experience the weather. That's why the climate is an example of what philosopher Timothy Morton calls hyperobjects. Um, hyperobjects are events or systems or processes that are too complex, too massively distributed across space and time for humans to get a grip on. Another hyperobject that we're all in constant contact with is the global financial system. Like climate change, finance is always happening everywhere, and yet it's strangely nowhere. You never have access to or perceive the totality of it at once. It has very real effects, but a single cause doesn't seem to apply. I would argue that this is where storytelling becomes so important. One thing stories can do is provide points of access. Philosopher Stephen Shaviro argues that, quote, fiction is one of the best tools we have for making sense of hyperbolic situations. Fiction comes to grips with abstractions like economies, social formations, technological infrastructures, and climate perturbations. We may model such an object mathematically and computationally, or else we may encapsulate it in the form of a story. Fiction can foreground human subject experience without reducing the universe to it and in that way move beyond the two options we're usually given for the way the future is supposed to go, total utopia or total dystopia. It allows us to ask whose utopia and whose dystopia. If the human is not the protagonist, which is which? What if utopia and dystopia are happening all the time, right now, on different scales and different places? In order to speculate on weird futures beyond the human, we have to dive deep into weird pasts. The past has also has to become a speculative, weird, unknowable place. And in fact, the forceful decentering of the human has happened at various points in the deep past. In my own work, I've been fascinated with weird narratives from several hundred years ago, specifically about mystical encounters from the Middle Ages. At its most basic, mysticism is the unexplainable confrontation with the weirdness of the cosmos. While mystical encounters are often explained away within the framework of organized religion, they aren't actually specific to any religious context, and mystical states have happened throughout history all over the map. But for medieval Christians, God was the ultimate hyper-object who could only be accessed in weird ways. The mystics who accessed him wrote narratives about physical encounters with God's body and liminal states in which their bodies were deconstructed through divine contact. As a way of connecting this to science fiction, these are entirely comparable to contemporary accounts of alien abductions, where first contact with the alien leads to terrible dissolution of the self. The question of whether these stories are real or fictional is besides the point for me. They're true to the person who experienced them, and they have to be true to the reader to meet them on their own terms. What's going on in these stories is a serious confrontation with a mystery. Approaching the stories on their own terms without trying to explain them away according to current conventions of realism, which would have the mystic be crazy or tripping on rotten fungus, for instance, have allowed me to think through issues of materiality, scale, and agency in ways I couldn't have if I were only thinking about interplanetary spaceship travel. For this reason, I suggest that the new weird is not futurism, but has more to do with splicing across time periods and geographies. This splicing is needed if we're going to imagine a future at all. A lot of people have pointed out how difficult it is for us at this point in history to imagine actionable or even viable futures where we persist. So in trying to construct future imaginaries that don't glorify dystopia or reach blindly toward utopia, neither explaining everything or giving up on explanation, we can't go on fighting or fleeing or attempting to understand according to current frameworks. It's worth saying New Weird is not the only proposal for ways to do this. It's one name among many coalescing styles and movements, many of which are even more propositional and less evasive than the weird, 
Afrofuturism, Xenofuturism, solar punk, all of which I hope will be the subject of future evenings like this one. The weird is just one way of recognizing the human as a part of weird and eerie ecosystems, possessing powerful yet very limited agency. Fiction allows us to consider a range of human and non-human experience, especially marginalized, weird forms of knowledge as valuable points of access to enormous systems. The job of such fiction is to seek out, but also to invent something very new and very weird. So a word on what's gonna happen tonight. We'll have two talks by speakers, Alison Sperling and Jim Clark, circling around these gigantic topics. Their talks will be interspersed with readings um, from primary literary sources by the Young Girl Reading Group. The Young Girl Reading Group was founded in 2013 by the artist duo Dorota Gavenda and Egla Kulbukait. They meet regularly with groups of participants to read and discuss texts aloud, exploring how reading can be both public and intimate. Earlier tonight, we had a group of about 25 people take part in a reading group where we read Mark Fisher and Margaret Atwood, and it was really great. So reading along with Dorota and Egla as part of the program, we'll have Constanza Schutze, Anastasia Moser, and Joshua Waro. Thank you. After those talks, um, Tom McCarthy, the author, will join me in conversation about his work. Also, we'll somehow tie a lot of loose threads together or maybe add new ones. And then finally, we'll have a Q&A where everyone can ask questions of the speakers. Throughout the night, we're projecting images by the artist Rachel Rose on the ceiling. These are from a forthcoming video work called Enclosure about a science fictional Middle Ages. Also, thank you to Yana Sutila for the title image um, on press and social media. I'll make way now for the first speaker, Alison Sperling. Alison is a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute for Cultural Inquiry here in Berlin. She's working on a book called Weird Modernisms that theorizes weirdness across modernist American fiction through feminist and queer theory. Her talk is called An Unruly Weird. Thank you. 